Hey guys, in this video I want to talk about a new controller, the Thor 300 from Fungineers. It is their first in-house design of a controller, so not just a clone of an existing design, but their own proper design. It is a 20S controller, so at first it looked like nothing special and I had no strong desire to give it a try after already having a 24S controller like the Tronic 250R in my boards. And uh, yeah, but uh, Fungineers and I were chatting about it and he happened to have a spare one that he offered to send me, including his super sexy all-in-one CNC controller box. So I thought, okay, screw it, I'll give it a try. I'm not a big fan of building boards. I'm so tired of it. I'm not really good at it. But I put one into this board here. And yeah, at first glance, the specs don't look too special if you only consider voltage and this being 20S. But the first thing that stands out is the max amps. The Thor 300 stands for 300 amps. Um, supposedly, I even have tested like a 350 amp spikes. That's obviously with like proper cooling and so on. But still, even if you only take 200 amps as the maximum and you set that as your max amps that's huge that's a lot more that's like 30 percent more than what we've typically been using so that's a game changer and the second thing is the advertised lower controller temperatures due to um, the lower vrds on or whatever it's called of the mosfets used so they're basically using the best possible MOSFETs you can use that are suited for 20S. And that is 20S with region. And then the controller has a couple other goodies. It has um, momentary switch support, which means it can shut down on its own, which is something I've always been wishing for. Um, I added a buzzer that warns me if I have forgotten to turn my board off. But yeah, so I'm glad that they put that in. Then it has a built-in buzzer, which is really cool. I uh, don't have to add my own. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then it has the integrated VESC Express communication device with all kinds of functionality. Uh, it has LED support with, uh, I believe, up to 36 watts, 12 amps, I mean, 12 volts and 3 amps. I think I read somewhere 5 amps, but I also read something about 36 watts. So I'm not sure exactly what the maximum is, but seems plenty for LEDs. It also has a very small footprint. It fits into pretty much any controller box. You can put that thing into a pint. Um, and also what's really cool about it is there is no need for a thermal pad but instead all you need is just a thermal paste to attach it to your, um, to your controller box or heat sink or whatever you have. The one other thing to note is it uses the new GH style uh, JST connectors. Those are the ones that lock in, that have the little tab to take in and out, which some people will not like because they, don't, they can't reuse their existing PH connectors, but Personally, I kind of have always hated the pH connectors, so I'm glad they made the switch. So, let's take this thing out for a ride, and let's see if we can overheat it. I went to the worst hill I know, a hill that you can't climb with a GTS, with ATR or gradient tracking turned to the max, unless you maybe weigh 120 pounds or less. So on this hill, everything overheats on a single pass. Hypercore motors overheat, Little Fockers overheat, U-boxes overheat, the Tronic 250R overheats, and all that on just a single climb up. So, oh, on the float wheel, I probably have to take five or six breaks to make it up that hill on the float wheel. So, um, I tried this now with my Thor 300 combined with a Superflux HT and a 7-inch Burris driven by an 18S 2P P45B pack. So pretty much the strongest pack out there. Now, the results 
were downright shocking. Like the Thor remained ice cold while the motors started getting warm. Like, and I'm talking about, I couldn't even break 100 Fahrenheit, like 35 Celsius is the most that I got out of the motor. Granted, it's winter, so it's only about 60 to 70 out, but I, I know for sure this thing will never overheat, even in the heat of like Arizona desert. Um, it'll always be your motor that overheats first. So extremely impressive. I do also want to talk about some of the things I do not like so much about this controller. Let's start with the Vesk Express. So let's turn this thing on. And to connect to this board, you have to connect to the Vesk Express. I've renamed mine that way. Other people know that's not their controller. So you connect to it. And now you have, you're actually not connected to the controller. You're connected to the Vesk Express. You have to press CAN, then you have to wait for it to scan the CAN bus. Then you press Thor 300. Uh, and now you're connected. So now you get back over here and to verify you can go to firmware and you can see v6.2 thor 300 ao the reason that mine says ao it's always on it's a pre-production model so this controller actually um, you cannot turn it off i can press this button here and it stays on um, so i can only turn it on with the button and then it, uh, I have to wait for it to power off on its own. But because it has that momentary and auto shutdown uh, switch support, what I did in so what I did in float control is I added a way to turn it off. So I can press this Vesk off button, and that powers it off. So that way, if I want to load it into a car and don't want it to just stay on, I can turn it off this way. Also, I added that feature to the official VESC tool and VESC app, but that will only be available in 6.5 when that gets released. If you guys are using the beta version, you can get that now. So there is a shutdown menu option now in the latest VESC tool. Anyway, turn that back on. Yeah, I so um, so this is how you deal with the Vesk Express. As you can see, with float control, the connection is pretty much just as fast as with any other um, controller or Bluetooth module. So you really can't tell the difference, but the Vesk tool is just super annoying to deal with. And maybe somebody will take the time and make it more seamless in Vesk tool as well, because Vesk Express, that's a product that comes from Trampa and I would have expected that they would make it easier for people to use it. But uh, right now it's a little bit broken in my opinion. But anyway, I mean, I, I don't understand what the obsession is with onboard BLE modules. I prefer to just have a second UART port then I can connect my own. Bluetooth modules are cheap and easy to get. Why do we need onboard Bluetooth modules? It's really not that big a deal, um, or at least give us one where we can attach an antenna and then route it. Because in this particular box, I don't have any connection issues. It has a plastic lid, so the signals make it out really nice. But uh, I've heard that some people had problems with all metal controller boxes. If you have a aluminum box and an aluminum lid, then uh, apparently the connection isn't that great. And all the other functionality it has, maybe a year from now, we will really see the benefits. But at the moment, it seems like a solution to a problem that we didn't have in the first place. Now, my momentary switch, this is a pre-production model, so it doesn't work. But apparently even some of the production models do have some issues still with um, powering down the board. So I'm not sure what it will look like in the actual production versions, but the first few reports I've heard, they've had issues with it powering off. 
Um, but then for those people, supposedly, if you press the button for five seconds, if you hold it down, it will power off. I don't have that feature, so I always have to use my app or just wait 10 minutes. And that, by the way, can be configured in the VEST tool that's in the app config. You can change how many minutes until it powers off. Now, the LEDs. So this has 36 watts for powering LEDs, and, and this, the LEDs are controlled from the VESC, which, thanks to Mitch, is now a standard feature of the float package. So um, here we can change things like the, what's the idle mode here? You can change whatever mode you want, or you can just have it as a battery meter. You can change the brightness separately for when idle versus when riding. The controller has three onboard connectors, so you can connect front, rear, and status LEDs separately, and you can use basically any number of LEDs in each of those strips. But the problem seems to be that the LEDs that it supports, they aren't super bright. Um, also, apparently you can't just buy off the shelf LED strips. Um, they have to have four pins, meaning the D in and D out pin, if you want to have more than one strip connected. I only have the front, so I guess here it doesn't matter. But um, if you want multiple, the, the order, in order for them to be chained, they need to have that D out pin, which I guess is not standard on the typical LED strips that you can buy. So yeah, everything is controlled from a single pin. So they act like one long strip. And in float config, you have to configure how many LEDs you have for front, how many for rear, and how many for status. But it is really nice to have all these lighting modes now. And um, obviously, they are not very bright. So people that want to connect bright lights, I think they have to use a 12 volt to 5 volt down converter and drive it that way. So it's still kind of a custom thing that you have to do. I personally don't care about LEDs. I treat this as a trail vehicle and just like on my mountain bike, I'm not going to put lights on there. And when I ride at night, I wear a headlamp and a, a handheld light anyway, because that's the only way to see, because a light that's two inches off the ground doesn't do anything, right? Um, but this is great for people that uh, want to ride in the city and where there is laws where you have to have lights on your vehicle and that meets the criteria, but the lights are not nearly as bright what you would have as what you would have on a future motion vehicle or a float wheel. So I would not want to ride at night, even on streets with just those lights. You would still want some kind of a handheld light. So this is all I got. Overall, it's an amazing controller. The controller box is super nice and uh, the price is unbeatable. It's for $800, I think you get the CNC box with everything already pre-wired with the motor connector, with the LEDs. I think you also even get a status bar. I don't have that. Um, so it's, it's very competitive and the controller, I would say, is hands down the best 20S controller that you can buy today. I mean, it's the only controller that will never overheat because you guys probably know with a Superflux, pretty much all the controllers will overheat long before the motor overheats. The Thor flips that upside down, so now the Superflux will overheat first. But then again, all your riding buddies will overheat long before you do, so it doesn't even matter. You will probably, unless you just ride by yourself, it's gonna be really hard for you to overheat that um, setup. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful.